Best in a row. Uh, <laughs> it's okay. I just stay in one spot, right? So we hear you're the expert when it comes to Crim Pro yeah. and all that. Not Polyath. He's the expert when it comes to Polyath. Oh, I'm super excited. All right. So I just need to plug. plug. Yeah, as far as I don't care. 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 I I mean, I got a PowerPoint, so I'll uh, get to the point. I got a PowerPoint that I'll pull up. See if we're rocking a little. And then, do you want a lapel mic? Is that right? Okay. 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 Test, test. So I'm going to go about 30 minutes, and then I'll do my demo, and I'll turn it over to her, and then anything else, we'll have q and Okay.
Hello? Oh, sorry. Hello, welcome everybody to today's event, our first event of the winter 2019. Thank you so much for being with us today. Today's an awesome event. We're sorry for the delay. We had an event, we had a meeting here in uh, 205, went all the way up to 12. So thank you so much for being patient with us. We're super excited for today's event. Uh, as more people come in, come on in. Make sure to come fill the middle so we can get you here in the front. We got plenty of spots here on the sides. We have plenty as well. Um, before we get started, I want to make a big, a quick plug uh, for the National Symposium. It will be March 15th and 16th over in Phoenix. It's a one and a half day event. It's awesome. There, there's always a Supreme Court justice there. Last year we were the runners up for chapter of the year, and I think this year we have a good shot. So it'd be awesome to have you there. This is 19 of us signed up so far. We'd love to have more of y'all. We're going to be carpooling together. I'm going to rent uh, one of those 15 passenger Mormon arm vehicles. And we'd love for you to join. We're getting to Airbnb together. If you have family or friends in Phoenix area, uh, you're welcome to stay, to stay there and save some money. Uh, all right. Well, thank you so much. Today we are very thrilled to have two amazing speakers talk about a really, really interesting topic. Fun fact, I was our first event of the semester last semester, uh, Richard Duncan, I was talking to him and he, I was asking him, what speakers might you recommend? And then he, without skipping a beat, uh, he said, you got to do this Brian Morris guy. He does a live polygraph test. I think you might want to correct me. So he just, uh, and I can introduce him briefly. He went to University of Utah, we'll forgive him, but then went uh, to uh, University of Idaho School of Law. And from what I understand, while you were in law school, you were traveling as a FedSoc speaker. Is that correct? That's amazing. Uh, that would be a lot of fun. Uh, anyway, so I'll let uh, Mr. Morris introduce himself a little bit more in a second. He has a fascinating background. He's also very hard to find as a bio online. But I'd like to uh, in introduce um, Professor Bowen as well, who is here. Professor Bowen joined the law faculty here in 2017 as a practitioner in residence. She previously practiced at Snow Christensen and Martineau in Salt Lake City in the white collar criminal defense and commercial litigation practice groups. Served as a judicial clerk for Judge Campbell in the Dis U.S. District Court, District of Utah, and Judge Carolyn McHugh for the Court of Appeals 10th Circuit. Professor Bowen received her uh, bachelor's and her uh, I went to law school here at uh, BYU Law School, teaches criminal procedure, criminal law, and researches criminal justice reform. Please join me in welcoming our speakers today. Okay, so it is great to be here. Uh, what's not on my bio is I did go to BYU for a year. I got to go to BYU, the single best year anybody could go to BYU. Most of you probably weren't born, but when you win a national football championship, that's a great year to be here. And most importantly, I got the single most important thing in my life from BYU, my wife. So I have absolutely fond memories of BYU. I love coming back to visit here. Uh, in terms of my bio, there's a reason my bio isn't out there. I work for the Department of Defense. And so uh, all my travels and everything else that I do for them, it doesn't come up there, and I've been there for five years now, so there isn't going to be much of a recent bio for me here other than if you go to utahpolygraph.org, and I'm on the Utah Polygraph website. Okay, so let's talk about uh, connections just a little bit with the FedSoc. As you mentioned, I got to speak uh, as a speaker for the Federalist Society nationally. I did 17 events my 3L year uh, going around and talking to different schools while doing trial team, bankruptcy team, and uh, LSADR. So I got to do a whole lot, and I was super grateful for Idaho and the opportunities that I had up there. Now, uh, I was a polygraph examiner before I went to law school, and so that's where my uh, experience and my continued experience in that happens to be. I've worked for uh, a number of different agencies in seven western states, mostly law enforcement and Department of Corrections, Prior to going and joining the DOD, I did post-conviction sex offender testing on people who are under supervision, probation, parole, making sure they're complying with the terms of their treatment, probation, et cetera. Uh, education, when people talk about polygraph examiners, they go, well, what do you have to do to even become a polygraph examiner? So polygraph examiners, in order to go to polygraph school, 
uh, you have to already have a bachelor's degree. You've got 400 in-class hours, that's the basic programming, and then any specializations that you have to do to go beyond that. So I got to go enjoy 10 weeks in uh, Atlanta, Georgia, and if you ever experienced humidity, you know how bad summer in Georgia is. But it was a great experience. Uh, since joining the Department of Defense, one of the great things, if you like school, and if you're here at law school, you clearly like school, uh, I have two additional master's degrees that the DOD paid for, uh, and I'm starting my PsyD, so it's great to get education. All right, now when we talk about your cases, how many of you are planning on being prosecutors? All right, how many of you are planning on being defense attorneys? All right, there's the money guy. All right, so. When we talk about cases, who knows what percentage of criminal cases actually go to trial? Yeah, super low. Like most states, it's about 2 to 4%. So that means like 96 to 98% of cases don't ever actually go to trial. You know, the prosecutor has to be able to prove his case beyond reasonable doubt. And that's why confessions are so critical for all these prosecutors because a confession is going to end the need to have a trial to begin with. I mean, this type of evidence uh, makes everything else that's going on superfluous. You don't need a trial, so confessions are great. And so as polygraph examiners, if we're taking and we're working on criminal cases, we're law enforcement examiners, that is our end goal of those exams is to find out, is this person being truthful? If they're not being truthful, getting a confession from them. Because if somebody comes in and they take a polygraph exam and they do not pass the exam, but you don't get a confession from them, well, that polygraph exam hasn't given you nearly as much as you would hope to get out of it. I mean, it may well tell you, yeah, this is my guy and I need to go do additional investigation uh, so that I can get the evidence necessary, but the end goal always as a polygraph examiner if somebody's not getting through is to get a confession and just some basic statistics uh, This is back clear back what, 50 years ago 80% uh, of cases are solved by confession or incriminating statement. I mean this is the absolute playbook for everybody who's in law enforcement is we want confessions that's going to resolve our cases so back in 96, they did a study, and uh, in these interviews that they're taking and running as police detectives, 24% of the time full confession, another percentage of the time partial confession, another percent incriminating statements. So if we can even get somebody into our office, not even taking a polygraph, but just as a detective to interview somebody, I mean 65% of the time we're getting something that's going to take and help us. Only 35% of the time do they not get something that's incriminating because if they're going to bother bringing somebody in for an interview, there's a good reason for that. They've got reason, suspicion, something about their involvement. And so for us, getting them in the room and then being able to move on to a polygraph is even better. Now when we talk about uh, the sex offender testing that I did and how useful polygraph can be in that particular setting, we took and we did sexual history reports where people would write down, well, here's what I did. Because almost never does a sex offender get caught with the first victim that they had. There's always other victims uh, that aren't reported, aren't charged, etc. And so like, for, I didn't get to see the presentation before, but if we're talking about sexual assault trauma, well, those psychologists are critical to helping in get these people back in society with the tools necessary to not commit reoffenses. In order for them to do that, they need to know how many victims they had, what types of victims they had. And so this sexual history report, well, if you're a perpetrator, you're going to want to try and put your best foot forward and go, oh, I'm not such a bad guy. I didn't do all that much stuff. I only had two and a half victims was the average self-report. Well, when we would pull them in and say, OK, you're going to be doing a polygraph now, and if you're not successful in your polygraph, there's going to be some type of negative consequence associated with your treatment programming. All of a sudden, the number, on average, went from two and a half to over 13 and a half victims that these people had. Even just the threat of the polygraph exam and them realizing, whoa, I got to be truthful here, becomes a critical component as to what we can do. Now, lots of offenders, they'll say, 
well, I'm an offender because I was uh, offended upon when I was a kid. And two thirds of these offenders said, yep, I was a victim when I was a kid. That kind of explains my behavior because I learned it from somebody else. Well, when it came time to say, okay, you're gonna have to take a polygraph and is this truthful or not? Well, all of a sudden that number actually went down to one third, not two thirds were actually offended upon as youth. And then uh, when they were a child, if they were under the age of 18, you know, they say, well, did you offend before you turned 18 and became an adult? Well, only 22% said that they had done that in actuality. Again, over two thirds had begun their offending behaviors before they were an adult. So when we talk about sex offenders, most of them are beginning their activities before they even become an adult. All right, so there's lots we can do. Now when we talk about polygraph, it's hard to know if you got a good polygraph examiner or not. There's you know, limited ways you can take and find those things out. So I'm gonna refer you to a website, it's called polygraph.org. That's the American Polygraph Association website. You can look up by name and by state all the polygraph examiners that are members there and uh, be able to realize they have to do certain things in order to get and maintain that membership. Now Utah, being as I came from Utah, Utah happens to be the toughest state in the country to get a license in. We have to do 60 hours of continuing education every two years, which is a whole lot more than I have to do as an attorney. Uh, we have to take and do a one-year internship. We have two state exams we have to do, and we uh, have a lot of hoops that we've got to take and jump through. So in Utah, if you've got somebody who's state licensed, you already know you've got somebody who jumped through a whole bunch of stuff. But if you move next door to Colorado or up to Idaho, they don't have any state licensing. In California, you know, your primary care physician can be an acupuncturist. There are lots of people who say they're polygraph examiners in California and they've got no state licensing way in order to take and do that. So that's why I refer you to polygraph.org. That's a good way to be able to find out who a good examiner is. All right, now when we talk about the types of uh, exams that we do as polygraph examiners and ones that you as future attorneys may well be taking and dealing with, we've got five major types of stuff that we take and do. We've got pre-employment exams, we have intelligence, counterintelligence, specific issue, guilty knowledge, and internal affairs. So if any of you are interested in going and working for the government, how many of you are looking to go to the government? All right, if you're gonna get a security clearance, you're gonna be getting a polygraph most likely, depending on your agency. And so in those cases, they're gonna be doing screening exams. They wanna make sure that you're not a spy, saboteur, terrorist. They're gonna make sure you don't have any uh, unreported foreign contacts or allegiances to foreign countries that would be detrimental to you working for the US government. And so there's gonna be uh, a lot that we take and do on, on there. And if you look up legally, there's a lot of situations where we can't do polygraph exams in pre-employment setting. It's under the Employee Polygraph Protection Act, but government, is one of those exemptions because they understand how important it is to make sure we have the right people in there with clearances and the wrong people do not get clearances. And so we have a lot of different targets that we're trying to hit. Spy, saboteurs, and terrorists are very different things, but it's three separate targets we have to test on one test. So when you're taking, you've got multiple targets, you're trying to hit on a polygraph, this is not gonna be our most accurate exam, but it's definitely the one that we're gonna take and use. Uh, because at the end of the day, if we've got some people who are telling the truth and they don't successfully pass their polygraph, we've got hundreds of applicants for every job that we've got out there. And sometimes that's just how we sort people out is whether they can get through this exam or not. All right, specific issue. Now specific issue is really the quintessential polygraph exam that most people would think of when they think of a polygraph. It's, did you do X? Did you rob the bank? Did you steal the car? Did you shoot that person? One specific issue. And when all we're trying to do is one specific issue, this is definitely our most highly accurate exam because we've only got one target to hit. Now, if uh, I'm working for a law enforcement agency and you know, here's our uh, prime murder suspect, we say, will you come in and take a polygraph? And she goes, no. <laughs> well, we don't stop investigating. We've got other things we can do. We can move on to what we would call a guilty knowledge exam. And so if she won't come in and take it, but this person sitting right next to her is her best friend, and we know that she might have what we would call guilty knowledge, we can take and ask this person to come in and take a polygraph exam and ask them, did you do it? Do you know for sure who did it? 
Do you know where any of that missing money is? Uh, that type of a situation, because known associates are good ways for us to increase the amount of knowledge we have when we're taking and doing a police investigation. And then, of course, the worst kind of exam that we have to take and do when we're doing law enforcement is internal affairs. Law enforcement is obviously exempt from EPA, so we take and we do pre-employment law enforcement exams all the time. So if we're gonna do them to hire them, if there's allegations of wrongdoing, unfortunately, sometimes good people don't always make the best choices, and we can take and bring them in and have them take a polygraph to either clear them or to go, all right, well, obviously this allegation is true. All right, so why are we taking and using polygraph in law enforcement? I mean, obviously Utah County doesn't have billions of dollars to hire all the detectives they might want to take and hire to investigate all the crimes that are happening even here in Happy Valley. All right, and so with these limited resources, we want to take and be able to allocate those the best way possible. So the way that we're going to take and proceed with the case is, is we're going to take and uh, bring in that person who we think might have done a crime and say, hey, look, we'd like you to take a polygraph. Are you willing to take one? If that person says no, that's an automatic red flag for us. And we would take a look and go, okay, we can't scratch them off the list. We can't force them to take an exam, but we are certainly going to continue to allocate resources to uh, investigate this individual because we haven't been able to clear them through the polygraph exam. Now if that person comes in and they pass, well that's great, now we can go, all right, maybe we shouldn't be allocating so many resources to investigate this person, we're going to move them down our list of suspects here, and if we need to come back and circle around, we will, but at least we know maybe this isn't the place we should be allocating so many resources. If this person comes in and fails, that's the best situation of all, because now we get back to that interrogation and confessions and getting that person to take and confess. And so that's how we're going to take and uh, process people in criminal situations using polygraph exams, is to help us allocate our resources to be able to solve as many crimes as we possibly can. So with attorneys, there's lots of different ways that you can take and use polygraph. Number one, if your guy comes in and you're that defense guy making a whole bunch of money, he says, I really didn't do it. And you go, okay, well, I tell you what, they got a lot that says that you might have, so why don't you come in and I'll have you take a polygraph from my guy, all right? And if they come in and they pass that polygraph exam, well, that's good. Now you can go to the DA and go, hey, uh, you know, my guy took a polygraph, he passed, maybe this isn't quite the case that you want to take and proceed with because he's probably going to be a good witness. Now if that guy comes in and he doesn't pass, well, maybe that's an opportunity for you to remonstrate with your client and go, hey, you know, you didn't pass the polygraph from my friendly guy here. Uh, how do you think you're going to do if they put you on the stand? probably not going to do very well in that type of an adversarial situation. So maybe this is an opportunity for you to accept that plea agreement because if you accept the plea agreement, you're only looking at one to five. If we go to trial and we lose, you might be looking at 15 plus. Maybe this isn't where you want to take and uh, move that. I'm your attorney and I'm going to represent you how you want me to, but you know, you can take and use that. And as a defense attorney, you know, when you call me and say, hey, I want you to give my guy a polygraph, well, the result of that they're not at risk of going over to the other side. That's attorney work product in preparation for trial. And so you can take and keep that under your hat. If they don't come in and pass, you can uh, take and sit on it if you need to. And if your client wants to go to trial, well, that's just not discoverable stuff. All right, now uh, you can also use it for the corroborating witness to say, hey, you know what? I wasn't robbing 7-Eleven, I was over at Joe's house and we were you know, eating pizza and playing video games and that corroborating witness, that can be a good way to verify what it is that they're saying there. Uh, again, when you have to think about who's gonna get put on the stand and who we're gonna go to trial with and who I'm gonna try and avoid going to trial so that I don't have to go to the jury. Again, good tool that you can take and use there. Okay, so raffle. How many of you saw that we were doing a raffle? All right. So we got a bar review course possibly on the line here. All right, so uh, you in the front row, you brought the tie, good call. So give me a number, uh, one to 50, and we're gonna see who uh, gets to play for the room. 37. 
37. All right, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Thirty-seven. You, yes, point at yourself, you. What year are you? First year, all right. Well, I might let you phone a friend on this first one. So have you taken evidence yet? All right, well, this is going to be an evidence question, and I'll let you uh, phone whoever your best 2L, 3L buddy is that's going to know this. So it's showing your next slide. I'm worried that might compromise the answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that might compromise the answer. You're right. So we'll see how good she is. <laughs> so I'm going to take and I'm going to change the question just slightly. All right. So Fry versus the United States was the initial case that established what the expert witness testimony scientific standard was going to be. They called it the generally accepted test. All right, so it had to be generally accepted in its scientific community in order for that expert witness to be able to testify at trial. There's been a case after that that has since modified what that is. So what is that test or case that has the federal standard for expert scientific witness testimony? So who's your best buddy you want to phone a friend and ask? Besides a professor. Huh? Daubert. Daubert, exactly. Okay, so that's the Daubert test. And so that's the federal standard. And what's interesting is Fry is still kind of part of that test that they use, where it still is generally accepted in a scientific community to determine should this come in. But at this point, the judge is the gatekeeper as to what's going to come in and what's not, and they have a Daubert hearing and those things. Okay, so the next one, since it's going to show the answer, I'm not going to post the question, but you'll get to hear it and we'll post the answer when I'm done. So there is one state in the entire United States that polygraph is fully court admissible without any pre-stipulation, without any Daubert hearing. What state is that? Nope, this one's all you. You got a 1 in 50 shot. It's not Utah. Now you got 49. No. Not North Carolina. Okay, good. Well, that's 5,000 bucks I get to keep. Good. All right, so who does know what state that is? New Mexico. Ah, see, the California guy knows. <laughs> it's New Mexico. New Mexico, under their rules of evidence, uh, polygraph is fully court admissible under their rule 702. So if you're an attorney in New Mexico, you can bring up a polygraph examiner. You don't have to get a pre-stipulator or anything. Have you ever had a deal with the uh, Napoleonic Code system in Louisiana? I'm not an attorney in Louisiana. I'm not sure what the Napo Napoleonic Code with Louisiana is. I do know I've got a case like 15 slides down there where they had an administrative law judge who uh, took and did allow polygraph to be presented as part of that proceeding. They gave it no weight, but they did admit it. And you know, ultimately, the trier of fact has to give weight to whatever testimony they're going to take and listen to. Uh, and so. I know at least in Louisiana, you can get it admitted, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to get any weight uh, as to what's taking going on here. And so when I uh, pop back here, the map, wow, I had a lot of slides. This map, uh, licensing, no licensing. Well, we talked about the Fry case, 1923. We talked about the Daubert case. Uh, Daubert is now the federal standard, but when it comes to states, states are free to choose what rule of evidence they're going to take and use. So about half the states use FRI, the generally accepted test, which means there's not going to be any polygraph admitted in any of their proceedings, not even with pre-stipulation. Polygraphs out in FRI states. In Daubert states, if uh, 
the prosecutor says, hey, you know what, if you come in and you take a polygraph and you pass, I'm going to drop the charges. But if you come in and you fail, you're going to be required to accept a plea agreement. And if you renege on that agreement, well, then the polygraph is going to be fully court admissible. And the DA knows if I've got a one witness and I've got an expert on the stand saying this person wasn't being truthful, they're going to feel really good about their case and proceeding uh, accordingly. Now, Mr. Defense Attorneys, you know, if he's going to have a pre-stipulated case, well, the prosecutor is going to say, here's who my polygraph examiner is, and they're going to go, okay, well, let me talk to my client. And he's going to quickly ring me up, and he's going to go, hey, Brian, I need you to test my guy. I'm not going to send him to the wolves to take a pre-stipulated polygraph. I want to know how he's going to do. So I come in and I give him the exam. He passes the exam. About 30 seconds later, defense attorney is going to be on the phone with the prosecutor going, when can we come take your super reliable polygraph? Now, if the guy fails, <laughs> he's just going to sit there. And about 30 days later, the prosecutor is going to go, hey, I offered you this pre-stipulated polygraph exam. What are we doing? He's like, we're not taking your super unreliable polygraph exam. You just go prove your case. Well, I mean, the reason that a prosecutor is going to even offer a pre-stipulated polygraph exam is because they have a super minimal case. I mean, if they had, you know, good forensic evidence, DNA, fingerprints, hair, blood, I mean, any of those things that they could take and get an expert up there for, if they've got more than just he said, she said, they're not going to take an offer of that to begin with because they have enough of a case that they feel like they can go to trial with. But if they're kind of just he said, she said, well, if the guy comes in and he fails, I, I just won my case. And if he comes in and he passes, well, I've got a good reason at this point to go, hey, I just don't have enough to go to trial with. And so they end up dropping those charges. Okay, so let's move on to our demo here. Jessica graciously agreed to come and be my guinea pig. And the exam that we're going to take and do here is what we call an acquaintance exam. See, it's right there. And an acquaintance exam is basically the practice test we do before we're going to move on to a test that I'm going to do actual data analysis on. All right, so I had six cards. Each one had a different number on it. I just asked her to take a card, look at the number. Once she knew what the number was, just stick it in her pocket. Don't show me what the number is. All right, so what I'm going to be asking her here is regarding the number that's written on the piece of paper in your pocket, is it the number? And I'm going to go in order, one through 10. Now, I just want her to answer no. It's an arms up. Every single time for me. All right, obviously that means once she's going to be lying, and nine times, she's going to be telling me the truth because I want to see good examples of both of those situations. All right, so what we've got here, these are called pneumograph tubes. One goes around the abdomen, one goes around the upper chest. That's going to monitor and record upper body movement and activity. We've got a couple of finger plates here. These are called electrodermal plates. They're going to monitor changes in sweat gland activity that we've got here. And then we're going to have what we call a standard blood pressure cuff. And now, when we take and do that, I'm going to have her sitting there for you know, about three minutes. I can't inflate that cuff enough. Just palm down flat. Yeah. I can't inflate that cuff enough to see what her actual blood pressure number is. All I'm looking for here is relative changes in pulse rate and blood volume. How many of you had a chance to take a polygraph exam prior to coming into today? <laughs> All right. That's cool seeing like three. Usually I get one or none. All right. So we're going to take and do that now. Uh, she doesn't have a bar review course on the line, but we have to make sure that she has some type of motivation here uh, to be engaged on what we've got going. So I got a 20, 20 bucks in my pocket here. If I don't get her number, she's got 20 bucks to uh, go buy lunch. <laughs> All right, so the blue lines we've got up here, these are the two uh, chest and abdomen. There's green right here. Can you see it up on the screen? Oh, wow. Let's say that might be, uh, well, I mean, uh, how about now? <laughs> All right. So blue lines, uh, that's the uh, chest and abdomen. Green line is the electrodermal activity. 
And then the red line is the standard blood pressure cuff. All right, and now we're gonna see, number one, again, everybody knows here she's gonna be lying once if she follows instructions and answers no every time. Now imagine yourself sitting there as jurors. Your job is to weigh the credibility and truthfulness of the statements being made by the witness who's in the box. So she's in the box, you know she's gonna be lying once, we're going to see how good you are just being able to hear it, because if you're a juror, you're not going to get to hear any, you're not going to get to see any uh, thing. You're just going to get to hear her statements. All right, let's add a little air here and we'll get rocking, Jessica. You ready? Ready as I'll ever be. Perfect. Say, if you want to close your eyes so you don't have to look at them, <laughs> that way uh, you won't have uh, people getting you to laugh. All right. Please remain still. The test is about to begin. Regarding the number written on the piece of paper in your pocket, is it the number one? No. Is it the number two? Is it the number three? No. Is it the number four? Is it the number five? No. Is it the number six? Is it the number seven? Yeah. Is it the number eight? Is it the number nine? No. Is it the number 10? No. This test is now over. Please remain still while I take the instrument out of operation. You can relax. <laughs> okay. So normally when I run this test, I'm gonna run it three times. I'm gonna run it forward, one through 10. I'm gonna run it backward, 10 through one. And then I'm gonna run it in random order. Right, because everybody's a little bit different in terms of their physiology and what we've got here. I asked about 10 numbers, but there were only six possible numbers that she could have had. 
All right, we don't want the first couple numbers we ask about to be the possible correct number that is, if you want to start up for me. Yeah. We don't want that to be the correct number because, and you can go back to your seat and you can look at it too. All right, so you did a good job sitting still. That's hard in front of a big audience. We get what we call an orienting response when we first start an exam. You know, it's just the fact, oh, I'm taking a test. And so we don't want the first couple numbers we ask about to be viable answers that she's taking and lying about. So the only possible numbers that it could have been were the numbers three through eight. All right, all those are up there. So by show of hands, my jury box people, how many of you think she was lying when she said no at number three? All right, number four, number five, number six, number seven, number eight. <laughs> How many had no idea? A whole bunch, whole bunch. Okay, so this test, it's called a known lie test because we know if she followed instructions, she's gonna be lying somewhere. It's also called a peak of tension test. Up until the point that she lies, she is getting put under greater and greater stress until she lies, and then once she lies, she realizes she's going to be truthful for the entire rest of that particular test. And we take and we monitor pulse rate, blood pressure changes, uh, electrodermal activity, respiration, because everybody's a little bit different in terms of how they respond. For Jessica, her key response is, absolutely her changes in pulse rate and blood volume. All right, because if you look at, let's see if I get this to work. If you look at her uh, red line there, you see at number three how that's going up. That downward arrow is me simply readjusting the tracing because if I don't, it's gonna get up and it'll go off the page. And if you think about like the old analog pens and paper polygraph, well, if the pen hit the top of the paper or the bottom of the paper, you were losing data and you couldn't get anything anymore. So that's just an adjustment in the tracing. But you see it's going up at three, it's going up at four, it's going up at five, and I had to readjust it. It continues to go up at six. And then as soon as she lied at number six, that's what my 20 bucks is on, all of a sudden, what happens to her blood? It goes off the page, she's totally relaxed, she's like, dang. I lied and now I don't have to lie anymore. And so for me, I'd say, okay, Jessica, pretty obvious to me that your body says it was number six. six. Number six, <laughs> fantastic. So now, moving forward, I can go, when I see Jessica, if I see this big peak and rise and all of a sudden, this big relaxation, I know, man, she's not being truthful with me about that particular thing. But if I don't see those types of changes, well, then I know, hey, we're good to go. She's being truthful with me. All right, well, two minutes. I'm just going to give that over to you now and let you throw stuff, and then we'll open up for Q&A. All right. I don't know if this, is this working? Okay, perfect. Um, so... I am coming at this from not only a professor standpoint, but a former defense attorney. And so when I saw Mr. Byers raise his hand that he's staying true to the cause, I like to see that. And he's not just a money guy. All those prosecutors are power guys and things like that. Anyway, but um, I think the polygraph kind of falls within this realm of technology that's really cropping up. And Brian probably knows a lot more about this. But there's a lot of other kind of brain scanning and other biological technology that is kind of put in this realm of truth-seeking technology, right? And um, as Brian said, we often in criminal cases don't have this technology because we think we can get at the truth through other means, right? We can talk to witnesses. We can see what the other physical evidence is. Um, but in certain circumstances, we think a polygraph is going to aid in that function. But there are circumstances where we need to be suspect about that. And um, it depends on what party you're playing for or what party you're, you're advocating on behalf of. So uh, I think Brian really highlighted a lot of those important points that there are situations where a prosecutor really wants to use that polygraph, right? And uh, the polygraph was actually initially developed on behalf of law enforcement to be used as a tool in that 
in that regard. Um, and probably more frequently, I would say, at least from my experience, it's, it's more often a really powerful negotiation tool more than, um, and it's true mostly because you aren't going to trial that often. But in the case where you do go to trial, um, you do have to pass that initial threshold of this is expert testimony as we, I mean, in a very brief way saw just now that, you know, many of us looking at this were like, I don't know, it looks like her heart rate is really high all the time, so I have no idea. Is she just super nervous? Does she, you know, I mean, is she, does she just have this physical issue or, you know, any number of things? And so, um, as, as Brian pointed out, you have to go through that um, Daubert, or I worked for a judge who was a self-proclaimed Francophile, so she always used Dobert. Um, so it depends on what judge you're in front of, but um, we'll go with Dobert hearing. Um, and in that setting, you have to prove not only that this is generally accepted, or I mean the standard is different, where you have to show that this is re reliable and will be helpful to the jury. Um, there have been a lot of legal arguments that polygraphs are not only not helpful because they may be unreliable, but because they are administered by humans, right? It's a human reading some biological factors and interpreting them in a way that could be biased, right? We might have cultural biases or, or um, just some ideas about what assumptions we have when someone is lying. Um, but in addition to um, that kind of human factor, there's another argument to be made that um, uh, several scholars have put forward an argument that polygraphs actually interfere with the, the jury's ultimate function of being the fact finder. And so um, for those of you that have taken evidence, you may have studied Rule 704, which basically says you know, a, a, a witness cannot opine about the ultimate issue in a case or cannot you know, basically decide that issue for the jury because that's the role of the jury. Um, there are scholars who say that you know, a polygraph is very culturally powerful in a way that you come in and uh, you have someone like Brian who knows his stuff and does it well. Um, and he testifies for a jury to say, I think he was, this suspect was lying on question A. You know, the, on the question may be the ultimate issue in the case and that might take away the jury's province of really weighing all the evidence in front of them. Um, but so that's, those are some of the issues. Also, there's a lot of hearsay issues and it's a really complicated area of the law in terms of when you might be able to actually have an examiner testify uh, as to what a, a suspect actually said in front of them. Um, so there's a lot of really interesting issues that come in with polygraphs, but I would say for those of you that are planning to practice in employment in all the area or criminal law or in any of the areas where Brian highlighted these issues, um, it's an important area to have at least a basic understanding of when you might want them. Um, as a defense attorney, like Brian said, you want to have some sense of what you're dealing with and some context before you say, yeah, go ahead. You know, we don't, um, we have this sense sometimes that people won't tell a lie if they have nothing to hide, but some of these technologies can be interpreted in ways that may make that less um, reliable. And I'm out of time, but I think we have a few minutes for questions. I'll stay as long as you guys have questions, no problem. Thank you for coming. slide in terms of uh, just some basic scientific testing that is uh, very common. Let's see. Slide. Wow. All right. So I'm going to just pop through and pass it in here. So uh, you talk about the type of scientific estimate that's the uh, polygraph of usability in the country. Blue states are Daubert states, yellow states are Fry states, green states are New Mexico, and I'm going to polygraph the New Mexico tree. All right, so we talked about different types of tests that are out there, scientific expert testing. I work in, I had a whole bunch of them that played sports at a high level. Uh, that's other than the Olympics, it's just happening. 
We were in the x-ray office probably once a quarter when they played football, they were wrestling with heavyweights, and they get banged up. All right, and so they would take and they do an x-ray. And every time during the radiologist would look at it and go, oh yeah, clearly he's got a broken arm. Right, well, it's a bit of fracture, and you can see that. And you go, yeah, something's wrong. But then there are times that they would take and look at that 